now I have the pleasure to introduce our, our next speaker, who is Dr. Stephen Murphy um, of the University of Auckland, um, who has uh, entitled his talk, Subtle, Sublime and Sleazy, Pollen Carried on Wind and Water. So just a little bit about uh, Stephen before I get him to come up here. As I said, he is from the University of Auckland. He's a professor and chair of the Department of Environment and Resource Studies at the University. He's also chair of the Centre for Ecosystem Resilience and Ad Adaptation. He's chair of the Centre for Applied Science in Ontario Protected Areas and past chair of the Society of Ecological Restoration in Ontario and a member of the board and past chair of the Research Control Committee for the Ontario Invasive Plant Council. Um, a member also of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Committee of the Office of the Environment Commissioner of Ontario and holds associate editor positions with restoration ecology and weed science. So clearly um, a very rigorous background to bring to his talk today. So we welcome you, Stephen, and uh, I will um, perhaps give you a five minute warning by standing up. Okay. Thanks a lot. I want to use to do this, actually make sure you get a little clock up here to uh, keep yourself on time as well, but I will appreciate the morning actually. Um, yeah, I've become busy actually, it's been this sort of stuff. Uh, this morning I actually started with Laura with a meeting actually related to pollination, so it's been sort of a, been a day for me already. Um, I'm going here unfortunately briefly in the morning for you guys because I go back over and uh, my daughter's got a little event this morning, a little late this morning. Uh, but I was pleased to be able to get me here to give a talk because these sorts of events locally are always really important. And uh, Pollination Wells actually is well known as sort of, you know, the leader really across the country, if not for parts of North America, for this sort of approach actually. So you guys should be darn proud of yourselves, actually, the organization that are taking places like this across all, almost all the continents. A few in Europe, but not very much in North America. Uh, so congratulations. So my stuff is going to deal with uh, part of what I do in the lab actually, which is uh, wind and water pollination, mostly wind. Uh, you see today, and we do do stuff uh, certainly on the uh, other side of it with Forbes. Pretty good actually, it's a good, good start. And uh, so one of my grad students actually this morning is currently slaving away, probably cursing me, uh, because we can call the Canadian Pollination Initiative uh, run by Peter Kevin of the University of Guelph. Uh, we actually do a lot of work on bees as well. So, and, uh, indeed, this past week was our first tackle fly. Uh, for those of you who know a little bit about the pollination, they're really spring wildflowers and uh, Splitter Vicolas, which is the beetle actually. Um, this morning they're not too happy, it's too dark and cold actually, so they're hiding right now actually, or getting yeah, one of the two. Um, we'll find that. Wind, however, has no such problem actually, and for those of you who are allergic to stuff, you'll be suffering along with me very soon. Yep, I studied pollen and I'm allergic to it. Really. I didn't become allergic to it, I was allergic before I started, which just proves that I'm stupid, absolutely, really stupid. Because uh, I've been doing this for 30 years, I mean, I, I mean, I actually, when I was a teenager, uh, which is pretty good. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the work today, actually, and again, we'll leave uh, enough time for questions and stuff. Make sure that you guys get a chance to go through stuff, and uh, without further ado, I will uh, start up here. So one of the things I wanted to mention was is that this takes a lot of effort, so it's a Scythian task to leave despair. You get really bitter about it, actually, uh, in terms of sort of how things go. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there that we see. You've got a landfill site which you're trying to currently restore, or at least for pollination, which is a great idea. I always like that sort of, you know, one is a very famous meme on the internet, actually, the land is poisoned with actually sheep. <laughs> this makes a lot of sense, I know. Um, there's all kinds of stuff, though, that Sisyphean tasks, actually, that would not be a puzzle. I know it's a little early in the morning for that, but, you know, there are guys who have to do this sort of thing, so I became a pollination colonist. Uh, we don't deal with that sort of thing. <laughs> and, of course, you know, there are times you feel like this, don't you actually try to do restoration, pollination, and things like that, yeah. Uh, I don't believe quite in that, but there are those actually who really, really, you know, get very sort of much into the despair side of it. Uh, that actually is more parody, of course, than there. And of course, you know, we have a Saturday morning with a cartoon allusion to it, although unfortunately that tradition has kind of gone by the wayside. Um, so a lot of challenges. But as I tell my students uh, when they teach them undergraduate stuff in pollination and restoration, you can sit up in the corner and sort of curl up in a fetal ball if you want to, and they can put a little cloth over you. But that's not really what you want to do, right? You actually want to do what you guys are doing, which is sort of trying to do something in a positive way, in a very effective way. Um, so you saw Kevin actually with, you know, he's an implementation guy. Um, I'm calling guy. That's what I like to do, actually. In fact, there's a fairly famous photo at Queen's University where one night we had a really good party. I won't describe much more than that. 
but they dressed me up in a costume and I ran around Queen's University being Colin Guy, the superhero, actually, you know, really, really bad, actually. Um, ask me some other time about the stories. They're, they're really embarrassing, actually. Um, so what do we do in the lab? Well, we're, we're really, we're real masochists, actually. Um, this is essentially a task row, right? We've actually got across that, that big red line there. Uh, it's not quite, you know, exact, but pretty close to, for, you know, for the audience here. We've actually done five of these across southern Ontario, and uh, we walked them. No, we haven't done that. We've actually driven them. And what we've done is about every 25 to 50 kilometers over the last three years with camp pollen, we've been sampling, looking for wind and water sort of pollination, uh, how much pollen's being transferred, rare species, especially obviously wind pollination of grasses and things like that. We've also been working again on sort of the animal quality once for sure. But what we've been able to do is to do that because when I was in grad school, actually, I did one of these, not five of them, they didn't have a lab back then. Uh, so we actually have a 25-year comparison to see what's going on 25 years ago before climate change really got going. And uh, so what's going on today? So how things have changed? So we actually got this sort of major database we're developing through the auspices of CanPol. So uh, we've been very fortunate for doing that. So some of the work, uh, in fact, most of the work you see today is largely funded by CanPol and NSERC, the National Science Engineering Research Council of Canada. And uh, the work is uh, been all done by me, nobody else. I'm lying, actually. My graduate students, 29 of them, uh, have actually been working on this sort of stuff up there as well as 47 undergraduate students. So. Quite a lot of people actually involved in this sort of thing. I, uh, I think at this stage of my career, I'm kind of a spokesperson. I, I do actually go do the field work. I really, I do, I still do. But uh, it's all the younger folks that actually are doing an awful lot of the work because many hands do make light work. So we've been doing this, a little cross actually. We've done a little bit of northern Ontario, but mostly southern. And so uh, we've been sort of looking at some of the things that uh, there's the water one for you, the Alcineri actually out there. Uh, these things actually aren't doing too bad, which surprised us because the wetlands that they live in have been sort of starting to decline and things like that. But there's surprisingly enough farm ponds, believe it or not, farm ponds, which aren't too heavily sort of eutrophied, where these things have actually taken a bit of a foothold again. So we've actually found these things. You know those, uh, those little sort of farm ponds where people actually have deliberately sort of put some of the runoff and things like that? Actually, the nutrients do well for things like Valsinaria. They actually get in there and they live quite nicely despite all the animal feces, well, it takes nutrients, right? So from their perspective. So you'll find a lot of these things actually out there, and, and these are a little odd because you kind of get a sense of the picture there. What they do is they actually sort of essentially detach their entire uh, male sexual reproductive side of it, and they sort of float on the water going to the female side of it. It's not a very efficient way of doing it, not surprisingly enough, of course, and there are several other species that do it this way. So what they have to have is a very large collection of individuals in one small area, because otherwise they ain't never going to find a mate. Now, for those in the audience that are in fact single, it would be kind of like, well, you've ever been up to Northern Ontario actually, the lumber camps and things like that, where there's like one, 150 guys and zero women? Well, that's what these guys face sometimes actually, unfortunately, so it's sort of you know, a bit of an inhibition, to say the least actually. Uh, fortunately, of course, the an area like a lot of plants that actually has, you know, a couple of uh, as well as variations on them. Some of them are aphrodite, they've got two sexes of one, some of them aren't. Uh, so they're actually pretty good in terms of that. They don't really sell pollinate or anything like that. It's not very successfully. So they do do this. So we've actually found, surprisingly enough, despite all the wetland declines, the an area and a lot of these other plants that are up there actually are doing pretty well with all this sort of hydrophilic pollination, so pollination by water. And there's quite a little work sort of we still need to really do on it. Um, there's a couple of Joe Ackerman at the University of Guelph actually done a lot more work on this than I ever have. And there's a lot of other excellent people out there that have done quite a bit of work. So it's something that sort of we're trying to develop a bit more. But surprisingly, I'm going to how we find there's nothing, but we've actually found a lot of stuff in very, very sort of heavily sort of, you know, uh, altered areas. Uh, the thing that I'm actually sort of started out this business for was this stuff actually, killer pollen. Yeah, I'm kidding. Killer pollen, actually. No, not, not your children. Don't worry. It won't, it won't kill your children or anything like that, actually. Uh, what it does do, though, it actually does a real number on some of the other grass species. So uh, the biggest one out here is tiffany grass, flame pretense. It's kind of kind of declined over the years, you know. It's uh, if you really call it some forage grass in, in Ontario and elsewhere. Uh, it's actually named after a guy named Timothy. That's where the name came from, actually. And, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious looking. There's a pollen grape right there. Looks like any other grass pollen, actually. Sort of, you know. Try Colpate, and he's got three little pores on it. There's one of them up there. Try Sulca, and he's kind of divided into three. Doesn't exactly look like a killer. There's the plant itself way up here, actually, in terms of sort of where it goes. So, there we go. And uh, it's something, though, that, you know, it, uh, it does have a little bit of uh, this sort of thing going on for it, actually. Wu Tang Clan there. Um, it's something that, uh, you 
No, it actually turns it to do quite a number on a lot of different native species, actually. It also does quite a bit of number on the uh, really invasive grasses. The reason why I got interested in this thing, incidentally, is because we go out to some of the meadows, uh, some of the post landfill sites, and we find that succession in the process of replacing the plants was really slow. And, and this thing, Timothy grass, actually dominated. It's a whip. Like in terms of conventional uh, competition, it's a whip. Didn't figure out how it's going on. I mean, so we found out that actually what's going on is that uh, uh, this thing actually, sort of the pollen grain up here, has a bunch of chemicals in it, which uh, it blows up the pollen grains of other species. That's what it does, actually. Uh, I don't think it's actually adaptive or anything like that. It's probably an accident breed. Um, and it doesn't do it to its own species, so it's really convenient, right? If you're going to kill other things, you might not want to kill yourself. It's not a good idea. And so as a result, actually, we found a whole pile of stuff out there. I've tested a lot of species. There aren't too many of them that are like this. And, uh, but this one's one of the reasons why Timothy grass stayed around so long in Ontario and elsewhere. Um, and it actually has a real problem with some of the native grasses. Um, but it's not uh, all bad. It does, as I say, go after things like uh, crack grass. Lima's reference, actually. So it's a real problem with farmers and things like that. It also hates crab grass. It really, really does a number of crab grass, actually. Uh, but of course, then you get a domination Timothy grass, so you're not really a better off for him. So that's sort of what we sort of found in terms of some of the unusual stuff. Now, so this is sort of what goes on out here. This is the Timothy over here, and there's where you've got all kinds of stuff. There's Brobus nervous, which is invasive. You've got Phalaris rindinacea, which is sort of part native, part invasive. One of those weird ones. And then you've got a Linus reference that's your quack grass again down there. Kind of sort of pretty and sort of, well, it just, what it does is just sort of puts out a whole pile of pollen. And uh, a lot of these areas, the fields that they're in, what are called surface inversions. You know, at night it gets kind of cool. In the summertime, the, it gets trapped, and all the pollen sort of gets trapped in the field. You can walk into the darn thing and realize if you run a flashlight over it, you're in the middle of like all kinds of glowing lights. It looks kind of freaky. Uh, and it's one of those ones, what happening is you just got tons and tons and tons of pollen. So what you end up with is a pretty interesting situation where you've got sort of an uh, unusual interaction going on between different grass species. So it's something we've worked on for a long time, actually, from here. And it goes after sort of, say, well, the natives, so these are the ones that Moody Ulla rises and all this other stuff, these guys down here. Uh, unfortunately, there's ones that sort of goes after a lot of the native ones in meadows, which is one of the reasons why meadows have declined, although the main reason, of course, is that we farm on them. Not that one gets farming or anything like that. It's one of the reasons why we get so much declining is because, of course, we took the same areas that are really good for native grasses, and we said, hey, we can grow food on them. And so as a result, while well, the native nettles are pretty much long gone, actually, and things like timothy grass up there actually don't help the situation whatsoever. So it's something that's sort of looking at it. So what are we sort of finding sort of, you know, more of the larger trends? You know, that's an unusual phenomenon. Uh, a lot of the trends that we're seeing, of course, again, are due to the fact that we've got an awful lot of uh, land that's been altered. You know, urban areas, obviously farming areas and things like that. So you know, how much has it been? Well, there are different reasons, and that's a big one, of course, that alteration of habitat and things like that. Uh, the poor old Calamorosis canadensis, which is mixed here with some Phragmites, you know, one of our least favorite grasses, again, the uh, base of actually out there. Uh, we're finding actually the pollination success is down to 56% over 25 years, largely because poor old Calamorosis has dropped in the, in the, in the say, uh, population. So this is not a Timothy grass we kill a pollen. Now, this is just that what you got is sort of, you know, much less than the Calamorosis canadensis. You get fewer species, you get fewer mates, you get less pollination success. And uh, we suspect some may have to do with the weirder temperatures we're getting, but it's harder to demonstrate because, I mean, climate change is, despite what you can see in Fox News and places like that, is actually very real from a man-made standpoint. Uh, but it is something that uh, we, it's hard to link. It's very hard to isolate sort of that from all the other factors that are going on to it. It's probably contributing to it. Um, and, but the big one actually is, in fact, in this case, we've got an invasive species. Um, Beckmania, which is something that uh, if you actually go this time of the year around the Gulf region, it's actually uh, around the farm field edges, it's around there. This poor thing has actually sort of really dropped. It's down 86% because the darn species actually is down about 90%. Uh, and again, what's happened is, of course, just been wiped out by a lot of the land use choices we made, which is, uh, you know, fine getting a beat and things like that. But uh, some of the stuff you're in the landfill, for example, you can put stuff like this back here. Uh, not that I'm saying you have to do that, I'm not trying to tell you what to do or anything like that, but in other words, there are opportunities and some of the stuff that, that uh, this group actually does, which would be very good at sort of getting things like this one back actually out here. Uh, uh, this one is not going to be allergenic, as most of the grass will show you at least at first parts, so you have to worry about getting allergenic reactions to them. Uh, they're just actually parts of the things that actually sort of ensure that we get proper nutrient cycling in a lot of species, and they also create habitat 
for a lot of the other missing species we're finding, which is the coral pollinators, which uh, pollinate the, uh, the uh, forbs that are going on over there, and also the bird species that uh, live in habitat created by things like this. So if you remove the, uh, the grasses, you remove the wind pollination and sort of, you know, effects and things like that, you get this cascade effect. You get the rest of the sort of ecosystem kind of going with it, which is not something you really want to try to uh, encourage, obviously. Uh, there are others for grass species, Rostida, down 91%, for much the same reasons as the previous species. Uh, this one really took a number. Fescue, there you go, Festuco. That was a good coincidence, eh? Uh, that's a native one. There are 27 natives, or at least the taxonomists are fighting right now over, thanks to Paul Hamer at the University of Wealth, actually. Um, they're fighting over sort of how, which ones are which, splitters and joiners, and all those guys, actually. About 27 species of Fescue that are native, and about 47 that are non native. Yeah, the ratio is not that good. The stuff you got in the landfill actually is definitely not native. I've been out there. Uh, it's uh, that's something that's sort of a problem. So this poor thing actually has been outcompeted by the uh, fescue that we planted, and that's sort of one of the big reasons why a lot of these fescue species that are native are actually down. It's not hopeless. They're around. They're hard to find. Uh, even contract growers are actually are hard to find. And for example, I have some of them uh, because of course I've gone across the province and sort of found them. Uh, I'm not a contract grower. I don't go into business or anything like that. But it's something that certainly is not impossible to try to sort of encourage with respect to some of these replanting these species. So a lot of these ones are, are having some trouble. Um, for wind pollinated plants, sort of the irony is, is that you've got sort of both curse and refuge with respect to farms and cities. So as I mentioned, it's one of the major reasons why there's been declines because of land use choices. And yet, you'll find on the margins of the farms and within the cities, not planted, but not delivered. Just because of sort of the fact there's little sort of pools of habitat created, little waste areas, which are often dominated by invasive species, but not always, you find these little pockets of these natives which you don't really expect to find. And that's sort of the reason why I went across the province a few, few times was because we figured that that's probably it, that was my hypothesis. Uh, turns out to be right, so a genius apparently, actually. <laughs> no, I don't believe that either, actually. But, uh, uh, what was interesting was I figured it was there was somewhere, I just didn't know how much there was actually. We, surprisingly, we found more than we expected, which is kind of good news. And we found some bad news as well, some of the declines you've seen already. And, uh, you know, very, very briefly this morning, I'll go over some of the good and bad news actually, and then wrap it up so we get time for questions here and get us sort of, you know, on schedule and things like that. Uh, one of the big places for wind pollinated plants are like this. Wind farms are actually a big reason uh, why it's such a good place to be. Um, again, I won't get into long controversies over them. Uh, a lot of the, uh, there's been a good study though, I'll just tell you this much, there's been a good study in, in England and one of the states actually that find that the objections to wind farms drop with more money you give people. <laughs> yeah, I'm not kidding actually, they found actually that's the case actually. So I mean, you know, you gotta investigate stuff and things like that, but uh, from my perspective, uh, sort of, let's stick into the pollen this morning actually, the wind farms actually sort of actually do quite a bit of encouragement because it takes out a little bit of land underneath the towers. I mean, I think most people have a very strange idea about these things. They talk about how it's going to dominate the landscape and can't farm. Um, all the farmers that I work with for wind pollination and wind farming, actually, uh, they farm pretty much right up to the end of it. It's not like they sit there worrying about the fact it's going to fall down on any time soon or anything like that. Uh, the only exception is when you get like a hurricane, which we don't really get much around here. I mean, Hazel was our last big one. Uh, and tornadoes certainly are worries, so usually, of course, uh, you don't do that. But I don't know about you guys. But how many of you guys have known tornado will go in the middle of a field anyway? Yeah, and the farmers don't say, oh, I'll we'll harvest things today. That's a great idea, actually. So they don't worry too much about it. What you do find is sort of over the last number, so number of years now with these things, we're actually finding natives actually clustering around that area. So around the base of these things, actually, and then for over top of the little sort of woodlot there, we're finding a bunch of stuff, actually, that we didn't find before. Uh, it tends to be because, of course, they do, don't farm right up to it. And the colonization is pretty good because they, when they redo it, they actually sort of uh, loosen the soil a little bit, but don't compact it too much, so it's actually pretty good for the natives, actually. So, a really interesting way of doing it. Uh, we are finding some problems. This is obviously not Ontario, it's from the West. Best picture I had of Rome is Tectorum, actually, down in Rome. We're finding this stuff actually is coming out of the woodwork. It's a really bad invasive. Although in Ontario, it probably wasn't that bad, actually. It's spreading of all places from industrial areas, it really likes waste areas. And uh, it also turns out it likes aquarius and savannas as we store them to uh, landfill sites. Watch out. Um, you know, could come out of there. Uh, however, you can actually control it now, not at the landfill site, usually speaking. You, you heard, of course, the fact that landfills, you have to watch what you can do. That's actually for legal reasons. You normally can't burn at landfill sites, although it kind of depends on how old they are and where 
you were. Um, most of the time, you can control it with pyromania. The troubles, of course, were afraid of fire. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not suggesting we get stupid again, right? I'm not going to sort of suggest outside of this uh, church or hall, you start burning things in the prairies or anything like that. It's a little too close. But people tend to sort of think of fire as oh, it's really bad. You have a very weird history of fire with uh, human beings. They like it, they hate it, some of us like it too much. Um, you know, so I recommend that. But uh, it's something we can sort of control. So there are some things we're finding that are taking over, but in actual fact, I, I think we can probably do a pretty damn good job. Of actually controlling it. So we're finding this one's taking over a lot of pollination success in Romus Tectorum, which we don't want. We don't really want that at all. And we're trying our best to sort of mitigate it through other particular means, actually. Uh, masochism. I'm going to sort of, you know, segue off and sort of you know, end off the next couple of minutes actually here on, on this topic and uh, then sort of invite some questions, actually. But one of the things I do work on are things that people really, really are afraid of in terms of trying to identify it. Sedges, for those of you who are done botany or anything like that, sedges are real nightmares, right? If anybody tells you to identify sedges out in the field by sight, they're lying. Yeah. <laughs> there's a few you can do, actually. I've learned a little bit, but I mean, there's some. Scribbles after beer, it's actually it's not too hard. That's the one on the cap, right there. And uh, some other ones, little carrot scriophilia, actually, it's not too bad. It's kind of some flowery, you guys can tell, and that sort of stuff. So we've actually found the sedges, which are a really big part of the nutrient cycling across meadows in Ontario, um, are actually doing pretty good, surprisingly enough. Uh, that's primarily because they tend to sort of occupy margins of farmland, which are so marginal the farmers won't do anything. Uh, they also tend to be pretty good at colonizing a lot of the urban areas, even if they're polluted. So there are invasive supports that will come in as well. But these guys actually do a pretty good job. They tend to sort of establish some pretty good footholds. And as a result, they actually sort of tend to do pretty well. So we've actually found quite a bit of evidence uh, through pollen analysis and sort of seed set analysis and things like that, that a lot of these little guys that are really sort of kind of cryptic, really hard to identify, are doing pretty well. Most of the time, you've got to take them back to the lab and figure which species they are and stuff like that, which you can do. Um, so we often sort of know it's a sedge. If you can tell that much, triangular stem. Not too hard to figure that out, actually, but we don't know which one, other than maybe the genus and things like that. So it's pretty painstaking. That's why I say it's masochistic. You know, I really, I tell my students we're doing this, and they look at me like I have three heads. Nothing really like, well. You know, you want to get that long title thing that's your group up in there? You do this for a while, actually. It makes you sound important. It's fantastic. Um, let me get some basic ones, though. Uh, this one actually is uh, kind of a recent arrival in Canada. It's an English one, UK, and uh, something I haven't seen a lot of. But we're actually finding quite a bit around this area now, um, although not really in Guelph necessarily, we're finding more towards my area in Waterloo. Um, this Caracandula looks like it is sedge, frankly, so most people go so glad. Uh, the trouble is that in terms of what it does it, from a nutrient cycling perspective, it's not as efficient as most of the native ones. So it's not like one sedge is going to suddenly sort of, you know, cause a major sort of collapse of the ecosystem. What it does is it alters the ecosystem in subtle ways, and it's one of the parts of the title, actually. Um, so the pollination system, this sucker is pretty damn good. Right there it is, look at that, it's going crazy. And uh, unfortunately, because it is so good, uh, because this habitat is similar enough and the climate is similar enough, actually, it tends to be substituting for some native sedges, which is getting to be a bit of a problem, as I say, from a nutrient cycling perspective. So the pollination side of things often cause these cascade effects, success or failure. It's one of the things you gotta watch out for. Um, so mechanical masochism again, so I'm going to end off a couple of slides here. Um, just remind ourselves, you know, in my case, even though I'm doing sort of, you know, stuff, there's actually animals that are involved in this sort of thing, actually. We're actually finding sort of this uh, thing called Pleiadian Mercoquinis, it says it's invasive. Uh, the jumping spider that's there is not, in fact, invasive, actually. In fact, what it tends to do is it loves to use it actually as a place to trap insects. So it's actually uh, not hurting the plant, really. It's not. That stuff is still set seed and it'll be fine. But in actual fact, it's sort of discovered to be a good refuge for this uh, not all that common anymore jumping spider species, actually. But it turns out the Caladium, uh, Mathemersicoides, is actually in Florence, this is perfect for it. So it's one of those weird ones where the invasive, there's the palm grain actually, is uh, actually helping a native spider, which is kind of odd, eh? Um, you see this effect sometimes I think, out there in the wild, which is one of the reasons why, as much as I don't particularly want to encourage invasives, and neither should you, I do recognize sometimes, once you've got a game plan to sort of substitute an invasive for a native, <laughs> then you might want to sort of, if you're thinking about the consequences of going right out there and killing everything off at once, actually. If you take a scorched earth policy, for example, not necessarily a great idea, because, you know, what are you going to replace it with? Well, well I don't know. 
A lot of times they get very uh, passive in the sense of, oh, stuff will grow. Yeah, stuff will grow. <laughs> invasives, you know, so, or invasives, so probably not. So that's sort of one of the things I wanted to mention as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to sort of mention today, uh, just to keep us sort of right on time today, is sort of uh, uh, one of the ones we're having a little bit of trouble with, which is a very recent round of this Curious of Good Informers of European Lake Sedge. I'm going to end off on this right now. Uh, it's something that actually a couple of colleagues of mine found about roughly about 10 years ago now, 2003. Uh, it was probably around before then, obviously. Ottawa Valley, it's actually around here, actually here. Um, as soon as I found out where it was, I actually um, killed it all. <laughs> I had a plan, though, actually, to sort of restore the stuff, and we did do it, actually. So, we actually were quite successful at it. It's very small populations. You can do that if you have really small populations. Uh, don't do it with large populations that you don't plan for, like garlic mustard, for example, Everly or Piliato. People out there, they pull the damn stuff. Yeah, great. You pull one, you get 52 next year. I mean, you know, the seeds are journeying crazy. So you gotta watch what you're doing. It doesn't look really all that different. I mean, it's just full of it. But, uh, or it was. <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, it's something in there. So it's one of the things we're finding out in here. It's about the same concentration like Timothy grass. It uh, seems to be increasing in viability and things like that. Uh, the trouble is, is that we're now finding that despite some of our early efforts in Ottawa and elsewhere, we are running into some issues actually trying to sort of mitigate it. So, one of the messages today is sort of, you know, think of pollination, uh, wind, water, and of course insect, obviously, and others and things like that, as being part and parcel with a plan for invasive and also restoration. Um, so that's kind of my whole lab's gig actually from there. That's sort of the subtlety, the sublime side of it actually. And what I'll do, ladies and gentlemen, is end it off there so we can keep ourselves on time. We've got a little bit of time for questions. And uh, I'm appreciation for the invitation this morning. Thank you very much. Generally speaking, those are ones that sort of tend to be accidental. Uh, so you'll find, for example, skipper moss on timothy grass, for example, just because that's what I study, so I've seen the phenomenon. I don't consider it to be a true sort of symbiotic relationship because basically the skipper moss just kind of goes out there, gets a little bit of nutrients, and happens to get some pollen stuck on it. You know, so it's not a particularly sort of efficient relationship. Grasses are actually the most recently involved ones too, by the way. Actually, went back to wind from being insect, which is kind of interesting too. Other questions you guys wanted to ask? Um, how invasive is, are the miscanthus that people put in their gardens? The question is how invasive are the miscanthus? It depends on the species. There are some that are highly invasive, and then there are some that are really wimpy. There are like sort of pear dated maple trees and things like that, you know, which I actually my wife's planted some in our garden. Uh, they really won't escape no matter what you do. I mean, you could probably try to sort of, you know, give them enough nutrients to last an entire lifetime, and they still wouldn't get out of their hair there. And others actually won't escape pretty readily. So I would tend to avoid it unless you really know what your miscanthus actually species really is um, from there. I'm not sort of a, uh, uh, an absolute fanatic about uh, non-native plants. The only thing I sort of again sort of you know, draw the line is like you know you know they're invasive, sort of like the invasive, you're going to watch out for them, things like that. So, other questions? Yeah. I have a comment just to sort of tie into the animal side of things. A lot of butterflies and lots of huge grasses as a host plant. Yes, they do. Absolutely. So that's exactly a good, you know, good piece of insight for the audience is that a lot of the butterflies, in fact, moss, a lot of lepidopter in general, uh, do in fact use grasses as part of the life cycle. Sometimes the larval hosts, sometimes they even need stages, you name it, which is one of the reasons you find them hanging around on it. Sometimes when you see them on top of the grasses, they just more or less been sort of molted. That's not quite the sort of technical term I would recognize and try to avoid too much jargon. Uh, but nonetheless, sort of, you know, it's something that's part of it. So it's something that's kind of interesting in terms of sort of where we're going with it. Watch our moderator here. So, okay, that's great. Thanks a lot, guys. Much appreciated. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. I think, mean, in the context of us trying to create a, a large meadow at the East View Landfill site, um, we would like Steve to offer you a small token of our appreciation. If you would. please come back. Oh, sure. <laughs> Token, I like this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.